Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and right now we're flying through our own Milky Way galaxy. As you can kind of see from the simulation, there are a lot of stars out there. Billions and billions of them. The approximate estimates suggest that there could be up to about 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But relatively speaking, they're all kind of far away from one another. And because of this, we never actually expect any of these stars to collide with one another. So these star collisions generally don't happen. But stars do come close to one another, and sometimes really close to one another to even disturb the star system and potentially even steal a planet or two. And today we know that in the past at least a few stars did actually come pretty close to our own solar system, with one such star I discussed in this older video that you can find somewhere right there at some point during this video. Now how this influenced the solar system we don't really know, but it most likely had some effect. And I also mentioned in that video that these approaches do happen relatively frequently. But what about the next approach or the next star that's going to come close to the solar system? Close enough to potentially disturb some of the outer planets or maybe cause some sort of a disturbance in the Oort cloud and potentially even cause certain comets to come close to the inner solar system, maybe even leading to some sort of a major impact event on one of the planets. And there's at least one paper that came out recently the paper that, as always, you can find in the description below, that used some of the recent and most up-to-date data from ESA's Gaia telescope has been creating an extremely accurate map of all of the nearby stars that a lot of scientists have already used to learn quite a lot about our own galaxy and some of the nearby locations close to planet Earth. And interestingly enough, in this data they identify at least one star, a relatively unknown star, that's slowly inching toward the solar system and that's going to pass by the solar system extremely close to us in approximately 1.3 million years from now. And considering that Oort cloud, as you see right here, starts at a distance of about 1.6 light years away from us, with the inner edge being roughly around 1000 astronomical units away from the Sun, it is a little bit unnerving to know that this particular star is most likely going to pass through the entire cloud itself, approaching us as close as 0.06 light years away, or roughly around 4000 astronomical units away from the Sun. Although more realistically though, these types of disturbances of the Oort cloud do happen pretty much all the time. Mostly because there are three several effects that always influence the location of these comets, and they do get disturbed by other things as well. So it's not just stars. As a matter of fact, a star passage would be extremely rare. So these comets do get disturbed by other events much more frequently. For example, in one of the previous videos, I mentioned the existence of this map right here that shows us all of the nearby objects within about 30 light years away from us. And I've also mentioned in several videos that currently the solar system is flying through this region known as the local cloud, local interstellar cloud. But it's also flying next to another cloud known as the G cloud. And essentially by flying between these two very massive regions, there is quite a lot of disturbance happening right now, with one major disturbance that's going to happen in about 10,000 years, when the sun is going to exit the local cloud and very likely stay in between clouds and then enter the next cloud, the G cloud that's also going to disturb the comets once again. Now obviously what happens to those comets is another question, nobody really knows, it's extremely difficult to predict. But I guess the worst case scenario would be this. This doesn't happen very often though. And so a much more likely result is just a lot of comets coming within the inner solar system and creating a lot of light shows but also creating a lot of interplanetary dust. But because normally it would take them about a million years to get to the inner solar system after they get disturbed, we obviously still have a few thousand years, actually close to about 900,000 years, before we can actually even see any effects from the passage through this local interstellar cloud. But there's another effect that a lot of comets experience, it's the effects from the galaxy itself. It's what's known as the galactic tides. Now these tidal effects happen all the time as the solar system orbits around the center of the galaxy, and this is something that we also don't really know how to predict, but these galactic tides are very similar to the tides we experience on the planet from the sun itself. And so, for example, even though the majority of the tides on the planet are from the moon, some of the tides on the planet are also from the sun itself. And similar to how the tides from the sun affect the water on Earth, the galactic tides tend to stretch and pull on the Oort cloud, eventually disturbing some of the comets and maybe even causing some of them to once again come closer to the inner solar system. 
But when a star goes through the overt cloud and disturbs it, that's actually an extremely rare event. Although because of all of the data collected by Gaia Telescope, that is one event that is now a lot easier to predict. Simply because Gaia Telescope created an extremely important and extremely detailed database of all of the nearby and even not so nearby objects in the galaxy. But when detecting a star that's possibly coming toward us, we obviously don't just have to know the distance to it, we also have to know the declination, the velocity, the ascension of the star, and by using all of these details that are provided by the Gaia telescope, it's possible to sort of calculate the trajectory and the potential intercept of a star with another star. And this is related to a branch of astronomy known as astrometry, measuring precise motions of objects in outer space. Which is literally the main purpose for the Gaia Observatory. It provides all of the necessary data and all of the necessary properties for every object out there. Although the original mission was the Hipparchus mission, which was also by the European Space Agency, and this only lasted for about 4 years, back in 1989 until 1993. And so by analyzing all of the stars in the database, and also by estimating their trajectory going back and forward by about 5 million years, in this paper the scientists identified several interesting objects. Now their Gaia database name is basically sort of like this. But some of these stars obviously have different names already. With this star in particular being the one that seems to have the closest approach. And in this table here you can kind of see that the scientists use three different methods including methods that took into account the motion of the stars around the galaxy to try to find out which one would come the closest. And this one star, the one with the name right here, seems to be the candidate that's going to approach anywhere from about 0.02 parsec to about 0.051 parsec away from the sun. This is going to happen in about 1.3 million years. Now, as I mentioned previously, that's about 4,000 astronomical units away from the sun, which sort of puts it right here at the closest distance. So it's kind of going to go through most of the Oort cloud. But the thing is, we've already known about this star coming really close to the solar system from some of the other studies as well. The thing is, this particular analysis seems to be very accurate and does suggest that it's going to come even closer than we originally thought. And the star is Gliese 710. It's a slightly smaller and slightly less massive than our own sun star. It's approximately 0.6 masses of the sun and it's about 63 light years away from us right now. Now we haven't really found any planets around it, even though there are some in this simulation, but chances are we are going to be finding those planets as we keep looking at the star, because it is a typical object where we usually find planets. And also being a K-type star, it's an extremely interesting object, because normally these types of stars have a much longer lifespan to compare to our sun, and also have a tendency to have habitable zones with very stable conditions. So if humanity still exists in approximately 1.3 million years from now, and if we still haven't discovered how to travel across distances or how to visit other stars, we just have to wait long enough for this star to come close to us so we can actually try to get at least here. Basically interstellar travel by um, waiting. And that would make a pretty cool science fiction story as well by the way. But in this table you can also find some other stars like this one right here and this one right here that are going to approach the solar system even sooner but at a slightly farther away distance. And because in this study they also went back in time, they also discovered this star that we've already known about that did pass through the solar system around uh, 3 million years ago. And because of this passage, some of the comets 1 million to 2 million years ago might have actually increased collision chances in the inner solar system. Now when it comes to these collision events, or at least the presence of comets in the inner solar system, as I mentioned, there's a delay of about 1 million years, and it only increases the chance of the presence of the comets in the inner solar system by just a little bit, with the total number being about 12 comets per year, meaning that the chance for a major collision is still extremely small. But the chance for something like this is slightly higher. And the big emphasis here on slightly, it doesn't increase the chance of comets by that much. Nevertheless, still a really cool discovery and a really cool analysis. And once we learn more about what actually happens to various star systems when these nearby passages happen, we might actually discover some other effects as well. For now, we're still kind of not sure what exactly happens to star systems when one of the stars passes through the Oort cloud of another, because it most likely happens quite a lot throughout the lifetime of a typical star, we don't really expect this to be a very spectacular event. 
But the thing is, it's still really difficult to predict what's actually going to happen to planets or even comets when these star passages occur. So we don't really know if the star that probably has its own Oort cloud can maybe somehow share all of this material with the inner solar system as it comes close enough to the sun. Maybe by sharing these materials, this is how some of the planets might get materials they would not get otherwise. But that's of course just a speculation, and there's really no way for us to prove any of this just yet. But I guess for now, all we can do is just keep looking, keep analyzing, and keep trying to find out what happens to planets and stars when this does occur. For now though, well, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out the paper in the description below, all of the relevant links and data there as well, and subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you might have not known. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.